Hello everyone, my name is uh, Albert Cohen. I'm working at uh, Google Brain in Paris, uh, France, and uh, I'll be talking today um, as the uh, invited speaker to the ML uh, and uh, uh, Hardware Accelerator Workshop of the ISC conference. And I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. Um, so without further ado, uh, I would like to focus a little bit my presentation on some system level aspects of hardware acceleration. Uh, so not specifically uh, hardware uh, and computer architecture itself, but more uh, what are the impact of the, the blooming uh, space of hardware accelerators on, um, on compilers and systems in general. Uh, so let me first borrow shamelessly from the, the statement of Hennessy and Patterson's uh, during the, the, the Turing Award lecture uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so they, they essentially reflect on the, the challenges uh, that Moore's Law and Denard Scaling are facing uh, on the technology side. Um, and ironically, uh, the reflection is that this is actually a great opportunity uh, for a new dawn uh, of, of, uh, for computer architecture. It's like a new golden age, uh, like the, the term that was coined in the 80s and 90s. Uh, the golden age this time is that architects are freed from the, the, the chains of incremental short-term gains uh, with mostly fixed ISAs. Uh, and this is something that is uh, heavily uh, related with hardware acceleration, domain-specific uh, applications, and, uh, and also security. Uh, so machine learning is uh, one of the, the drivers for this specialization, but it's not the only one, and I'll come back to that. Uh, so I will adapt the, the, the statement to the more specific cases of uh, optimizing compilers and uh, systems for harnessing these uh, uh, hardware accelerators, um, acknowledging that heterogeneity is here to stay, uh, Domain-specific uh, languages and systems are just as challenging and uh, interesting to build as domain-specific hardware, and we need ways to help designers uh, from the language down to the to the hardware to actually deliver uh, systems that that work, that scale uh, both in size and also in uh, applications uh, and in uh, harnessing the breadth uh, of uh, all the hardware that's um, blooming uh, around that. Uh, Today, so this is a big challenge and opportunity for compiler construction. Uh, in the next uh, 25 minutes, I'd like to highlight a little bit some more uh, specific uh, machine learning and HPC context, uh, and uh, to understand better the opportunities for compiler in the, in, in this space. And then I'll dive in more specifically on some compiler construction uh, principles. Uh, a new infrastructure that has been uh, uh, proposed by Google, uh, which is called MLIR, that many of you heard about, and there's also some research directions. Uh, a quick detour, so why all of this is happening, uh, it's not only technology, it's also that there is a huge need from the application side. And um, so you may you may have a more slow uh, curve at the beginning of every computer architecture uh, presentation, but this is not more slow, this is much faster than more slow, this is actually the, the, the data and the model size increase of uh, leading machine learning systems um, in computer vision, in uh, uh, game uh, uh, engines, uh, uh, in all kinds of uh, uh, neural uh, uh, um, applications to uh, natural language processing, etc. And the model complexity is increasing much, much faster than, than most low if you, if, if you monitor the, that space. And this is a very big challenge, not only on the architecture side, computer architecture, has architecture side, but also on the full system. Um, and there is actually a virtual circle of uh, growing data, uh, more complex data uh, as well, more diverse data, uh, uh, feeding in research on the algorithmic uh, side, uh, how to adapt those algorithms to run fast on um, more and more specialized hardware and uh, hardware accelerators in particular. And this en uh, enables, again, um, more, like more applications with greater data uh, volumes, uh, more complex data, and so on. So th th this virtual circle is really what's feeding both research and engineering in, the, in that space. Uh, and as an example, and as you will see in the, 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 the other presentations of this workshop, there is a flurry of new accelerators, both on the cloud and uh, HPC side, uh, addressing different uh, uh, is uh, issues and uh, um, corners of the space, and also many, many act accelerators on the mobile and edge computing uh, space. Uh, billions of phones, uh, so many billions of uh, microcontrollers, and uh, for example, Google has proposed the Edge TPU as one of the uh, uh, designs in this in that space. Um, and uh, the, the main challenge here is obviously this diversity, uh, which is not going to, 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 to stop. Uh, we are going to see more and more diverse specialized hardware and also the composition of these diverse uh, elements into very complex heterogeneous hardware. 
Uh, and, and this is not only for cloud systems, this is also for, for phones and uh, uh, embedded hardware. Uh, and it's not only compute, obviously, memory, uh, energy spent in communication and, and storage is also paramount. Uh, so we have to address all this complexity uh, from uh, the, the, the angle of the diversity and the heterogeneity of the system and also on the heterogeneity of the data itself. Uh, uh, scaling is also in, uh, uh, obtained through tuning the algorithms to work on like custom uh, data types, uh, like quant quantized uh, for, uh, integers, for example, or low precision floating point numbers. And this is also a challenge for, for, for systems. Um, so maybe let me step back a little bit uh, again, saying this is not only the, 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 the fault of the hardware uh, here, so that diversity in hardware is actually a good thing. Uh, as uh, Hennessy and Patterson uh, pointed out, this is a great time for, for, for this diversity to emerge, but there is also a big responsibility for, for of, of the systems people and uh, compilers, but also more generally uh, runtime systems, frameworks, uh, APIs, programming languages are also extremely diverse. And uh, here is a list like TensorFlow, uh, obviously from Google, but also the, 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 the emerging JAX framework uh, you may have heard about um, and uh, PyTorch, which is extremely popular, uh, etc. All, all of these frameworks have some relation in terms of um, uh, operations they support, graphs they support, models they can implement, whether they can actually mix and match machine learning models with um, data processing upstream and downstream. And, and all, but, but although they have similarities, they also have, they, 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 they essentially make portability of models very different, they're difficult. So none of this is scaling, whether you're talking in a hardware perspective or systems perspective, this is not scaling from a, a community and engineering point of view. So we need to do better. Uh, interoperability is a, is a key, as I just mentioned. Uh, there's some consistency issue uh, in terms of what developers are facing, but also not only end, end users, uh, application developers, also the engineers of the compilers and systems themselves. Uh, they are in finite supply and they are very uh, well paid, uh, uh, scarce resource. Uh, 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 and this is not going to, to come to an end just because more people are going to be hired to work on this. We actually need to, to work on the causes for this, uh, the, uh, these, these inconsistencies and try to actually fix them. Uh, otherwise, we will never scale uh, to, to address the full problem. So we need some kind of standard, and this kind of standard is lacking at the moment. Um, so maybe instead of, of just complaining, we should propose something concrete. Uh, we all know that in this case, coming up with um, a standard for building systems and interfaces can be extremely costly. We also need that programming languages uh, and research in programming languages has been pretty good at uh, delivering on that space. So is there hope that we are going to use programming language technology to actually address these challenges? And is there actually, uh, uh, is the investment actually coming up to, to make this happen in, in practice? And the short story is, uh, yes, this is there, this is happening. It has been happening for uh, uh, more than two years already. And one of the answers is called MLIR. Um, and MLIR means multi-level intermediate representation. Also, there can be many other uh, uh, more uh, unofficial meanings uh, for ML uh, in that space. Obviously, you can find more information online. Uh, but MLIR was um, uh, first started at Google in 2018 and was open source uh, more than a year ago. And in September last year, it was also contributed to the LLVM Foundation uh, under the Apache 2 license. So this is not a Google product anymore. This is uh, uh, managed by the LLVM Foundation, both in terms of IP and governance. And there are many partners from industry and academia who are also contributing and announced uh, products um, based on uh, MLIR. So the, the main goal was initially to rationalize the TensorFlow ecosystem, uh, more specifically uh, TensorFlow itself, um, going from, uh, from the cloud level to on-device uh, embedded mobile AI, um, working at both graph representations and also down to the execution environments and, and, and backend compilers. And this uh, this was only the beginnings. It has grown much more uh, in, in um, Spectrum. So now it can be used much beyond TensorFlow. Uh, there are people playing with other frameworks, uh, connecting MLIR, uh, based uh, tools at the graph level or, or code generation level. And it's also used outside ML by people working on, on HPC, like climate modeling, uh, for example. Um, so this is largely due to this contribution to the LLVM Foundation. Uh, so let's dive in and in a few minutes explain what uh, MLIR really is. Um, so it's essentially a compiler construction, uh, uh, set of compiler construction tools. Uh, people refer to it as intermediate representation in the compiler world, and it's extensible. That's its first characteristic. So there is no predefined set of types, um, compute operations, control operations. 
everything is customizable in so-called dialects, and dialects are capturing uh, domain knowledge and uh, domain-specific transformations, uh, analysis, etc. Um, it was primarily driven by machine learning training and inference uh, at all scales, but it's, as I said, it's also now used in other domains uh, thanks to this extensibility. Uh, it builds on LLVM-style uh, API uh, components, uh, offering best-in-class programming models and technology. It's all in C++, but there are bindings for other languages emerging. And uh, it's also independent of the execution environment. So there are runtime systems developed for MLIR, but MLIR is also meant to be used with existing uh, uh, runtime execution environments. Uh, and obviously, it's heavily modular and uh, reusable, and I have more about this in a few, in a few slides. Uh, and the other key uh, aspect of MLIR, as the name says, is that it's multi-level in the sense that it enables progressive lowering of abstractions. So if you have graph-level abstractions for like, data flow systems, uh, machine learning uh, models expressed as data flow graphs, uh, you can incrementally lower, uh, these, uh, progressively lower these abstractions towards uh, like loops, control flow, memory management uh, that is becoming increasingly explicit. Uh, for example, if you want to offload computations to an accelerator and also down to instruction selection and backend compilers. So this is the same infrastructure you are using at the graph level and at the low level. Um, let me dive in immediately on a, on a concrete example. So you may, you may use a similar syntax uh, if you are familiar with the LLVM uh, compiler infrastructure. Uh, so you have operations, not predefined set of instructions, but you have these um, bold operations like TensorFlow uh, convolution example at the top. Uh, it takes arguments that are specified by the TensorFlow API, uh, and um, you capture it as just another uh, MLIR operation, which respects the so-called static single assignment form uh, uh, hypothesis. So you, essentially, you see that as a data flow graph embedded into a, a low-level programming language uh, syntax. Uh, from this uh, high-level operation representation of convolutions, you may want to lower it, to refine it, uh, uh, to get closer to a a specific uh, execution environment. And in this case, you may want to use the XLA compiler, for example, which is TensorFlow, uh, the TensorFlow compiler for uh, generating optimized code on both TPU, GPU, and CPU. Uh, and in this case, a convolution will involve at some point some, for example, some all-to-all -all communication, like a reduction uh, or scan or something. Uh, in, in, the, in this case, there is already an operation offered by, by XLA. We only need to model it in the IR itself, in MLIR and have some transformation rules that lower the convolution into a bunch of operations, including this particular all-to-all -all communication. Further down, you may want to model uh, code generation, for example, on the CPU or on the GPU, and uh, code generation will involve some instructions, uh, like an addition, uh, branch, etc. And the all-to-all -all operation will be lowered into uh, some uh, control flow surrounding this, uh, enclosing these, these uh, low-level expressions. All of this can be matched uh, uh, using rewrite rules. Uh, rewrite patterns, optimization heuristics that uh, implement strategies to um, uh, activate those rewrite, uh, rewrite rules, and in a very modular and structured way. So, you, for example, you may want to lower some specific convolution of the graph while keeping other parts of the graph um, invariant, and uh, based on uh, feedback from the, the compilation, you may decide to um, restructure the graph or apply different lowering, lowering patterns on different uh, parts of the graphs. For example. So, it's extremely modular, and both from the user perspective perspective and from the compiler construction perspective. Uh, all of this is within one single uh, IR, again, so in terms of code we use, we are expecting a lot of benefits. And in particular, you're not supposed, you're not uh, limited to modeling uh, sequential control flow or high-level, uh, uh, like, mathematical graphs of expressions. You may also model pretty low-level uh, control flow dynamic features that are found in modern um, ML frameworks, like TensorFlow 2, for example. Uh, you can execute both um, lazy and eagerly, lazily and eagerly, uh, the, these graphs. And you can also explicit concurrency explicitly. So if you're finding yourself uh, in, the, in, in the position of uh, optimizing latency, hiding latency in a, in a very complex uh, uh, implementation of a model uh, on a very concrete system, uh, heterogeneous with accelerators, etc. You can actually model all the latencies in the system, all the explicit data movements and specialization of uh, control flow uh, uh, that is going to leverage this, um, these features of your hardware. Uh, and you can express this in the IR using the same infrastructure, whether you're at the graph level or very close to the, to the hardware. Uh, a part of this is made possible uh, by um, uh, the usage of implicit futures, which is a 
very basic concurrency construct in, in programming languages. Uh, and so asynchrony and concurrency is essentially managed implicitly through the, this future abstraction in various places in the, um, in, in the MLIR dialects, for example, at the graph level, but also at the runtime level. Uh, you may want to uh, dive in the presentations about the new TensorFlow runtime called TFRT that also makes use of this, uh, this concept. Uh, so it's not limited to uh, graphs, as I mentioned. It's also great to model low-level code generation. For example, if you're interested in GPU acceleration, uh, you may want to use MLIR uh, all the way down to uh, generating LLVM uh, bit code for CUDA devices or uh, other devices, uh, like SPIRV, for example, Vulkan. Um, so there is support for all, the, all these dialects of low-level GPU programming, both on the host side and the uh, kernel side, device side. Uh, and this lowering goes through some common infrastructure. For example, uh, if you are interested in uh, linear algebra, uh, like um, matrix products, tensor contractions, and also convolutions. You have a generic uh, pattern to capture those called LINALG, which will model both the operations and their lowering. And then you have ways to lower these uh, mathematical constructions from the tensor space down to more explicit memory management uh, using uh, uh, arrays called memrefs uh, in, uh, in MLIR. Uh, you have ways to formalize uh, optimization problems using some sort of polyhedral uh, um, framework uh, embedded into MLIR called affine and going down to vectors and loops, uh, et cetera. So all of this is, again, making use of the same infrastructure. There was a presentation at some MLIR uh, open design meeting last year, if you're interested. And I encourage you to attend those meetings if you're interested, obviously. Um, so stepping back a little bit, so MLIR, again, is not something that will provide you an end-to-end solution uh, for a specific compiler problem. It's more a bunch of building blocks and modular components that you can use at multiple levels of abstraction, from graph level down to uh, code generation, and through a bunch of rewrite rules, lowering passes, uh, canonicalization passes, legalization, etc., that you'd like to do in a domain specific uh, and drive in a domain specific way. Uh, so it's not specific to TensorFlow. It can support multiple frameworks and it's not specific to a specific TensorFlow runtime either. It can also support multiple runtimes on the, on, on, on the execution platform, uh, whether you're on the cloud, uh, on the cloud device, on an HPC setting or embedded mobile setting, etc. cetera. Uh, so for example, it's not opinionated in as a compiler uh, without understood as a code generator uh, either. You can see it mostly as wrapping um, library functions. For example, if you have uh, numerical libraries provided by uh, the, the, the vendors, hardware vendors, uh, like the Intel MKL or QDNN from, from NVIDIA, for example, you don't need to actually generate low-level code. You only need to harness and orchestrate the existing library operators. And you may want to combine MLIR modules only for that purpose, skipping the code generation part. Uh, or you may not even generate code at all, uh, uh, even at the higher level of uh, library functions. You may just use ML MLIR as a framework to optimize graphs, implement domain-specific like algorithmic optimizations um, from graph to graphs, and even to, con to convert one graph to another. For example, if you want to um, uh, migrate some model that was designed initially for the cloud to work on the uh, embedded environment uh, using TF Lite, uh, you can use MLIR for that today. Uh, so let's let's zoom in now on more concrete uh, things you can do with MLIR that are not yet uh, necessarily uh, as popular in terms of uh, uh, conventional users in the in, in the ML space. And uh, let me explain, for example, one kind of research pro project that we are um, building on top of uh, this platform. Um, so. The, the, the general direction here is that we want to not only compile to accelerate machine learning models, I would call it compile to learn, or other people call it that way. Uh, we're not only accelerating ML layers and uh, uh, transforming graphs, we are also trying to learn to compile. So using, uh, like dog fooding our ML technology to actually build better compilers and to make compiler construction cheaper and uh, more portable. Uh, so we want to build heuristics automatically, for example, from, uh, from models that are being uh, uh, accelerated uh, on the hardware that we are compiling uh, as well. So this is a mutually beneficial pro uh, process. And the picture here depicts um, uh, the, the, the Google brain actually fighting the, the, the dragon uh, compiler. Um, so the problem statement, maybe uh, if we zoom in more precisely on one project, would be to synthesize very fast machine learning layers or operations, starting from very low uh, um, user intervention. So you don't want to essentially do much more than specifying the constraints that your hardware accelerators uh, have in terms of local memory, uh, computation, and communication devices. 
uh, and you like the compiler to automatically invent its means uh, or to synthesize, in other means, its its way to uh, adapt a machine learning model, uh, specified at a mat mathematical level, um, to leverage those devices. So you could call it also super optimizing, but for loop nests and numerical kernels, while super optimizing is typically coined as a term uh, at much lower level uh, when optimizing like basic blocks uh, uh, of, of assembly code. So we're trying to synthesize super optimized um, numerical implementations uh, bypassing most compiler expertise and uh, from 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 the users and essentially inferring that that uh, that expertise automatically using machine learning uh, based on some very simple um, uh, like declarative uh, rules and uh, and constraints. Um, so that's that's key because essentially going back to the very beginning of my talk, uh, we see this blooming space of, of hardware accelerators. Uh, if we want to scale, not only we need a great infrastructure like MLIR to reuse code, but also we need to automate much of the specialization uh, effort. So when you build uh, new heuristics, uh, it can be extremely tedious. It can be an endless race to, to, to bridge this widening gap of performance uh, across uh, devices. And you want this to be automated, otherwise we will run out of, uh, of compiler experts, and we already do. Um, so let's take a very uh, uh, intuitive metaphor. Uh, uh, so you all know this picture of the, the Beatles crossing Abbey Road uh, that was used for a famous um, uh, uh, album cover as well. Um, so I didn't ask for permission to, but I hope that nobody will complain. Uh, we want to synthesize these kind of pictures uh, without actually uh, asking people to um, uh, theatrize, uh, to, be, to, to act as, uh, as professional actors, basically, uh, and, and tell them exactly what to do. So we'd like to essentially come out with uh, naturally the right space and the right um, uh, look uh, to actually get these pictures right uh, fully automatically. So that's what I would call synthesis in that case. So you have some kind of high-level algorithmic specification. We, you want these four people crossing uh, uh, with uh, like evenly spaced um, positions, for example. And uh, this is actually modeling the, 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 the spec. And at the hardware level, you want an implementation that's precisely timed such that this is happening. And uh, of course, timing is only one of the issues. You want uh, memory resources communication to be orchestrated the, 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 the right way. So hopefully, you get the metaphor. Uh, so this is hard. OK? So there are many ways to get it wrong. There are many uh, implementations that may be functionally correct at some level of abstraction, but not the, the picture you want. Uh, there are really many, many ways to get it wrong. So if you look around on the web, you'll find tons of uh, uh, interesting and funny examples of people trying to replicate uh, or mimic that, that, that story. Uh, so this is exactly the kind of problems we are, uh, we are hitting here. Although uh, the number of choices to implement, uh, like a tensor contraction, for example, or convolution on a GPU or accelerator hardware is actually uh, several billions uh, or more, depending on the choices you expose, which is much more than the number of pictures you'll find on the internet for this particular crossing, uh, uh, hopefully. Um, and uh, the way we, had, we, had, we approach that problem is uh, uh, essentially uh, twofold. So we take a compiler and we make it uh, much more declarative by specifying the constraints that it needs to satisfy in a constraint solver. Uh, maybe you're, you heard about constraint programming, which was popular in the, in the 90s and, uh, and since then has been used to solve many optimization problems, like logistic optimization problems. Uh, so this is the way we are going to declaratively define the hardware, essentially. What are the uh, meaningful ways to generate code uh, that runs uh, functionally correctly on, on, the, on hardware? Uh, but we're not telling anything about performance uh, yet. And then we are going to use a search uh, heuristic that is not also uh, dictated by the, uh, by the user, by the expert. It's going to be learned automatically. And we're going to use reinforcement learning for that. Uh, at the moment, we use a pretty basic form of reinforcement learning. Uh, uh, I'm going to, to, to talk about it in the next slide. But uh, in the long run, we want to use much more advanced uh, uh, like state-of-the-art reinforcement learning uh, that's been popular in many domains. Um, so let, it, let me explain in a couple of slides. So the, 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 the search space is described as a set of candidates. So these are the, the candidate implementations for a numerical kernel. Think again of a convolution or tensor contraction, um, where every optimization choice or implementation choice is a decision variable that's going to be searched by some reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, and taking a decision in that space is not, as you may think, picking a particular implementation right away. It's actually a progressive uh, lowering mechanism as well. So it's more like restricting a domain to a subset of the possible choices. So when, when you make a choice 
uh, you're, uh, you're actually uh, refining the space of, of, of implementations you're considering, but not immediately focusing on a particular one. And only in the end, when you have taken all the decisions, you actually have uh, a fully specified implementation and you can generate code to run on target hardware. Uh, that, so that's basically the end result of the search, but that's not the search problem itself. Uh, uh, that, th this is a concrete example. So again, using some LLVM-like or MLIR-like syntax, you may have um, uh, like three operations, uh, loading data from memory, adding a constant uh, to that data called X, uh, resulting into a variable Y, uh, and then iteratively uh, accumulating uh, some data into uh, some, some other variable, um, uh, Z. And uh, th this is uh, very much, at this point, unspecified in which order you are going to uh, uh, schedule those instructions or whether you are going to iterate on one statement or one instruction or, or another. Uh, in fact, we model the ordering and nesting decisions as uh, constraints uh, and uh, decision variables, as I said before, and only the search technique will incrementally refine those uh, uh, ordering and uh, nesting decisions. Um, the only thing we know is that uh, some decisions uh, uh, are coupled. Uh, they, they have to be coherent with respect to, for example, transitivity of ordering, um, or in the case uh, at the bottom, uh, if you decide that, for example, X, uh, the X variable is going to be scheduled in, inside the loop, the D0 loop, for loop, then uh, because Y depends on X, it also has to be nested within that same loop. Um, so there are some, or either nested within that same loop or another loop uh, that will come after it. Um, so these are the kind of constraints that you will state that implement uh, functional correctness uh, for your programs. Uh, so this is an example. One decision you may take will be, okay, let's schedule X within the loop uh, and close it in, inside the loop rather than execute it before. And this is pruning the decision space for uh, the ordering of the X with respect to the X variable with respect to the D0 loop. But when you do that, you are inconsistent because Y used to depend on X and it seems to be not consistently scheduled uh, within, the, within the loop itself. So this is exactly what constraint propagation does in the constraint solver. It will figure out uh, the, co the, the, the constraint that has to be um, met. And by restricting the, the, the possible decisions on X, you also have to restrict uh, as a result, the, the decisions on Y. And this is happening automatically in the constraint solver. Uh, so based on this, we can actually expose a much better search problem to, uh, to, to reinforcement learning or whatever heuristics you'd like to, to build. And in this case, it's much more, we believe it's much more um, amenable to uh, like brute force uh, RL approaches, reinforcement learning approaches, um, because it's, it makes the search space much more structured and uniform. Uh, basically, all decisions commute, uh, obviously, some decisions are not compatible, but the ones that are compatible, you can take them in arbitrary order. This is very different from applying program transformations in a compiler in general. And also, all the decisions are known upfront. So this is something you can capture on the IR by saying, these are all the possible decisions I have on this set of uh, uh, instructions. Uh, and uh, uh, also, yeah, constraint propagation is a very uh, popular and uh, well-established framework uh, that scales to large problems. Uh, so this is kind of ideal for reinforcement learning, and uh, I don't have time to, to zoom in on the, the specific algorithms we are using, but uh, uh, essentially we are uh, nesting a reinforcement learning algorithm within a, a constraint satisfaction problem. So we have the solver essentially used as a constraint propagator, like making sure the constraints are satisfied and propagating those constraints eagerly. Uh, and using uh, uh, the constraints to model which transformations are correct, uh, uh, are, are coherent. So if you zoom in on GPU uh, cogeneration, for example, uh, these are the list of transformations that are commonly implemented when generating high-performance GPU code, on, on, for example, the CUDA device. Uh, so you have so-called loop strip mining, so you decompose a loop into multiple levels of nesting. Uh, permutation of those, uh, of those loops, fusion of the loops, which is very critical, obviously, for um, uh, uh, exposing uh, uh, data reuse, pipelining, scheduling, uh, rematerialization rather than storage, uh, like computation versus storage trade-offs are very important on accelerators uh, in general, and also on the data space, like memory layout, data layout, uh, tr uh, data transfers, double buffering to hide memory latency and, and vectorization. So these are the kind of transformations we can model, and we model them as uh, commutative choices in this in this space. And the way we uh, integrate reinforcement learning is as uh, a heuristic that's being trained through. The, the, the search process. So the, while the constraints are being satisfied, at the same time, you also evaluate some um, like uh, policies or uh, 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 
evaluation strategies of profitability, immediate and also long-term probability uh, profitability. And uh, you can use a performance model also as a guide to cut some branches in the space. So this is actually very important. It's not only to, to select interesting corners of the space, it's also to cut out, um, to prune out full branches of the space that are not interesting. And we have a, a, a rather original, let's say, roofline model uh, uh, of performance that operates not on implementations themselves, so not on fully specified programs, but on partially specified uh, uh, um, implementations, meaning some decisions have been taken already, and many more decisions, think of ordering or nesting of instructions into loops, have not been decided yet. Uh, so this kind of very early model of performance uh, while you are still searching for the best um, the best implementation. Uh, so combining these two approaches, like a strategy to guide the search and a strategy to prune the search using branch and bound and this performance model, we can actually prune most of the, 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 the space uh, very early on uh, from the first choices in, in, in the, that are exposed to the, to the optimization problem uh, and, uh, and, and scale to much larger optimization problems. By much larger, I mean uh, a few tons of contractions, not like full graphs, obviously. This is more like uh, at the operation level we are, we are working. Uh, again, zoom, uh, fast forwarding on the results, we are able to match or outperform state-of-the-art cogenerators. So you may have heard about Halide for image processing pipelines or TVM for machine learning. Both of them uh, use uh, similar inter internal representation and, and framework. Um, there are other research uh, um, proposals like Lyft and uh, Triton, Triton uh, that achieve similar goals for specific domains. Um, and um, essentially, we're able to uh, match the performance or be the performance of these tools fully automatically. So without uh, designing uh, uh, like expert-driven heuristics or schedules. Uh, so this is subject to ongoing research. It's not open source yet, but we are going to release it at some point as part of the uh, like a sister project of uh, MLIR. Uh, and we are still working on some uh, uh, search problems, uh, like the variance in the execution time is a big problem for this kind of um, automatically uh, generated, uh, like automatically synthesized optimizations, uh, as you may know. Uh, there are also issues with scalability. So it's great to prune the search space, but sometimes the performance model is just not good enough at, at, at that. Uh, so we still end up into many more dead ends in the search space that uh, we end up into practical implementations that run on the system. So there are some issues there. Uh, and also uh, Monte Carlo tree search, which is one very basic reinforcement learning technique, uh, is a little bit uh, uh, nasty in that respect. So it has, uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily expose a very nicely understood distribution uh, of, of, uh, of, of costs and, uh, and um, uh, like sampling of the search space due to the way it interacts with uh, branch and bound. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is something that we, ho we hope to address with more uh, advanced reinforcement learning techniques in the future. So let me let me conclude. So the MLIR project is both an engineering and a, a research uh, uh, platform. Um, so it's primarily driven by systems uh, uh, reuse, component reuse across systems. Uh, it's very much targeted at uh, the heterogeneous world of hardware, uh, of hardware accelerators that we are uh, witnessing uh, uh, growing and exploding today. Uh, it, that's thanks to its extensibility and reusability uh, by design. So we really hope to see more and more um, adoption of MLIR in both industry and uh, academia for, for uh, to address those challenges. Um, uh, it's not necessarily uh, a machine learning only system. I focused on machine learning in my presentation, but there are other HPC domains um, uh, that are being interested in uh, leveraging that, that, that technology. Um, essentially, domain-specific languages for high-performance computing are the first-class uh, citizens of, of MLIR. And the same thing about uh, domain-specific hardware, uh, it's not only for ML uh, acceleration. Uh, the reason it works is that we have all this ability to mix and match abstractions at different levels uh, within the same IR and reuse components, uh, whether you're defining new type systems or um, new concurrency constructs, uh, new accelerator-specific constructs. Uh, etc. That also means to model debugging, tracing, security properties in a transparent way uh, across these different domains in MLIR. So again, you don't have to reinvent your uh, uh, like uh, developer environment or the debugger support every time you move from one uh, domain to, to the next or one accelerator to the next. I didn't have time to, to talk about this, but you can find more information online. 
Uh, and also, it's uh, it's a great vehicle for research. And I proposed one example of research we are conducting in this uh, in this space. Let me also add here because ISC is a European conference. Uh, it's a worldwide event, obviously, but it's usually based in Europe, in Germany, and um, much of the work on the core infrastructure and also on these research topics uh, is actually happening in Europe. Uh, for example, in Munich, uh, Paris, and uh, London. Uh, so. Once again, thanks for your attention. I hope this is uh, going to be interesting food for thoughts and discussions and uh, looking forward to discuss with you in the Q&A session uh, on Thursday.